Hello, welcome to this second PowerPoint on AC 4.1. And in this one, we're going to be looking at um, how individualistic theories inform policy development. In my previous PowerPoint, we looked at biological theories. Um, this is quite a common exam question. So really, we're looking at how individualistic theories have made laws, policies, uh, treatment of criminality, all those sort of things within society. So let's crack on and see what we can do with this. So let's start with psychoanalysis, obviously based on Freud's individualistic theory. Um, and basically, uh, Freud saw that these unconscious conflicts between the id, the superego, were a cause for criminality, particularly a weak superego, because then the criminal hasn't got the moral force to curb their, self their selfish instincts. So a weak superego, Freud believed, uh, was a result of inadequate socialization as a child. And so sometimes criminals will be prescribed so psychoanalysis. Treatment's very lengthy. Uh, Freud saw his patients five times a week, and that happened, often happened for years. And psychoanalysis involves bringing these unconscious conflicts and repressed emotions up from the unconscious mind into the conscious mind so that they can be dealt with and resolved. And quite often Freud would use uh, things such as hypnosis, word association, etc., to get the patient to do that. Now, it would be true to say that uh, psychoanalysis is expensive and actually isn't used that often in today's society. However, it is a policy that has been influenced by individualistic theories, particularly that of Freud. But you could also use this example here, which is um, August Eichhorn. And he applied those psychoanalytic ideas to policies for treating young offenders at the institution he supervised. And he argued that because these young offenders had uncaring or absent parents, they hadn't developed loving relationships. They hadn't socialized normally. So they hadn't developed a superego. And that's um, linked to Freud, but it's also similar to Bowlby's ideas that maternal deprivation could cause criminality. And so Icorn uh, was quite advanced in his thinking. Um, certainly he, he was doing this in the 1920s and he actually rejected the harsh environments of young offenders institutions and treated the children by providing a happy and pleasant environment that would make development of the superego possible. So there you have a policy that's been linked to psychoanalysis. Give these um, delinquent children that are in these um, young offenders institution a pleasant environment so they can develop the superego. Now, as I said earlier, psychoanalysis actually doesn't seem to be that effective and is hardly used nowadays. I mean, certainly, Isenk in his studies found that only 44% of psychoanalysis patients treated for neurosis showed improvement. Whereas if those patients were treated by a doctor or at a hospital, 72% of them improved. So it would appear that actually going to a hospital or your GP is probably better than going to a psychoanalyst. And ISEC argue that if psychoanalysis doesn't work for neurosis, it seems unlikely to work for criminals because ISEC argued they are neurotic. It's part of that PEN um, idea of the criminal uh, of ISEC. Also, it's costly and time consuming. So in reality, it's never been used as a large, in a large scale for treating criminals. And of course, there's always that criticism. There's a power imbalance between the therapist and the client, client and that raises ethical issues. Now, if it was me, I would either, if I got a question on individualistic theory and policy, I would be writing about token economies because these have definitely been influenced by individualistic theories. So I'm going to take you through token economies. And a token economy program is basically one that's designed to obtain desirable behaviour in closed institutions such as prisons, young offenders unit, use, uh, units. Um, they're a form of behaviour modification. And they started in the 1960s 
uh, given the success of the use of learning theories in changing behavior. So they're linked to individualistic theory. So the big study was done by Hobbs and Holt, and they did it in America and Alabama with uh, delinquent boys. And what they wanted to do was discover the effects of a token economy program on criminal behavior within the uh, Young Offenders Institute. Now, what they did is they took 125 delinquent males that were Alabama boys industrial school. Uh, it was a state training school for delinquents located in an urban area and the boys resided in five independent cottage units. So there were five distinct units which made up this school. And the age ranges were between 12 and 15. Now the boys had charges ranging from truancy, uh, uncontrollable uh, temper, to homicide. So there's quite a, a big spectrum of crimes present within that unit. So the staff in the cottages agreed on a number of target behaviours that they wanted the boys to show. And that was things like following rules in group games, completing their chores, following general cottage rules, interacting appropriately with their peers, line behaviour, so what that means like walking in a straight line, following simple instructions, etc. And they collected the data uh, by they got the boys' names were listed on a daily chart and the cottage supervisor would then mark each behavioural category. So they collected the data that way. And the boys were told that the staff were taking records. And signs were posted up all around the um, cottages listing what was expected, the criteria. And boys in each cottage were then rated on each target behaviour by two staff members. So. Each day, the supervisor counted the tokens each boy had earned. So if you behave well, you got a token. If you behave badly, you didn't. So if you towed the line, tokens were gained. And the boys went to a token store weekly and they could exchange their tokens for a variety of reinforcers. So reinforcers included things like they could buy extra drinks or sweets. They could buy games, cigarettes, or they could save up the tokens, bank them, and they could then be exchanged for more expensive reinforcers uh, such as trips going home, etc. And they did a control because they introduced it in three cottages, but the fourth cottage didn't take part in the token economy system. So they used that as a control. So you could therefore compare the other three cottages to see how effective the program actually was. So. They collected the data over 14 months and what they found was the token economy resulted in an increase in the mean percentage of appropriate behaviour for each cottage and there was no noticeable improvement in the uh, comparison cottage where a token economy wasn't happening. So in the three cottages where it was happening, much better in behaviour, in the one where it didn't happen, no change in behaviour at all. So in cottage A, uh, appropriate behaviour increased from 66 to 91%. In cottage B, from 46 to 80%. And in cottage C, 73 to 94 So you can see the stats there, a massive improvement in acceptable behaviour. Uh, so there are pluses to this. It can be, it's an easy um, thing to do. It can be administered by anyone with a bit of training and the tokens and rewards are relatively cheap, so it's not expensive to run, and there are more benefits than costs. And it's been found to be successful in many studies, even though it should be noted that approximately 10 to 20% of people, just there's some people it just won't work for. So 10 to 20% of people don't respond well uh, to token economies, so it just doesn't work. Um, but what they have found with token economies is that it doesn't always transfer to the home environment. So it works well in prisons, but when you come out of prison, that behaviour isn't necessarily transferred. So there is a chance of recidivism. It doesn't cure that aspect of criminality. And obviously programmes have to be carefully planned and controlled. And there's always that danger that there's a lack of consistency from staff. 
So, how is token economy? Well, in, in America, they use token economies. And in my past slides, you see me with a few tokens up there to show how they use it. We use a type of token economy in our prison system because we use the incentives and earn privileges system, i.e. P's. And basically, these are rewards, so similar to the token economy, that prisoners can earn from sticking to the rules. And you've got basically three levels within our prison system, which are basic, standard and enhanced. Everyone starts on standard. So everyone starts on this one here. And if they tow the line, prisoners might be, you know, if they're on standard, you can you're able to spend more money um, than they uh, more money that they earn each week in the um, commissary, in the canteen, or whatever. If you don't tow the line, down to basic you go. And if you're moved to this level, you know, for refusing to obey orders, you lose privileges. So that might include no TV in your cell, meals must be eaten in the cell. But if you behave on standard, you can be moved up to enhanced. And if you consistently obey the rules, you earn more privileges, such as more gym time, TVs, more visits, etc. And I found this on the Internet, which is just a poster that's been designed by a prisoner in one of our prisons, which gives you some of the things that you get in that specific prison uh, if you are on enhanced. So, you know, access to a book club, three extra gym sessions, DVD evenings, three extra visits a month on a family day option to buy games, consoles, DVD players, and so on and so forth. So we have adapted the American token economy system and used it in our prison system to encourage good behavior. So as I said, some studies showed improvement in behavior, particularly whilst in prison. But the issue is when the offender leaves prison, the positive behaviors tend to disappear because there's no what there's no reinforcer there's no reward for behaving well however offenders generally return to crime more slowly compared with those who've not undertaken the token economy program so it definitely has its pluses and one of the negatives though is there have been cases in the usa of food or drink being withheld and used as rewards and many critics have said that's a human rights issue. It's not a privilege to be earned. So there are some abuses of the system. And that is a negative of the token economy. But nevertheless, token economies have, influ have been influenced by individualistic theories. So that then moves us on to aversion therapy. Now, aversion therapy is probably linked to ISENC's personality theory. It's been used for the treatment of sex offenders, also for alcoholism as well. Um, ISENC said that you know, criminals tend to be strongly extrovert and neurotic. That makes them harder to condition. They're more resistant to learning through punishment. So you've got to make the punishment harder for them to learn. So your conditioning needs to be stronger to change let's say the sex offenders behavior. So this is what they do um, for the treatment of sex offenders. Offenders are asked to think about an unacceptable sexual fantasy until they're aroused. And then they get a strong aversive stimulus, one the individual would choose to avoid. So they might get an electric shock or a nausea inducing drug administered that makes them sick. And then they repeat the procedure until the offender comes to associate the deviant behavior, the, uh, the, the, you know, the deviant arousal and the stimulus. So the aim is to stop the thoughts and therefore stop the offending behavior. So that's for the treatment of sex offenders. But if we look at treatment of alcoholism, uh, you have a nausea producing drug for conditioning, and then you add that drug to the alcohol. Every time the person drinks alcohol, they are sick. And then in the end, they start to associate alcohol with being nauseous and therefore stop drinking alcohol because it makes them sick or they associate it with it. That is aversion therapy in a nutshell. Now, it's had limited success. It's usually only short term and it's been abused. And certainly in some countries, it's been used to try to cure gay people. And that's definitely a, a human rights abuse. So we have this headline here. 
gay men given electric shocks to cure homosexuality at Queen's University Belfast and you can see the link there if you're interested just copy that link and off you go or it's been used in China uh, to try and cure homosexuality that link there will take you to a YouTube clip about aversion therapy in China and you know it's it's a clear human rights abuse but again everything that comes in is open to abuse so it's been used for treatment of sex addiction uh, sex offenders it's been used for alcohol addiction but also it's been abused for treatment of uh, homosexuality so that's aversion therapy but the one the other one I would do um, is cognitive behavior therapy CBT so this is quite common it's used a lot in our system and it's a definite policy that's been influenced by individualistic theories so basically cognitive behavioral therapy CBT has been applied to a range of offender treatment programs and what you're trying to do is change the way that offenders think and their attitudes um, change their attitudes and in that way you change their behavior so an example of a cognitive behavioral therapy program is the think first program now that's a, a program of group and one-to-one -one sessions for repeat offenders on probation and that's run by the probation service which aims to enable offenders to control their thoughts feelings and behavior so it's teaching things like problem solving skills consequential thinking so thinking about you know what are the consequences of my actions if I do this decision making seeing things from other people's points of view so empathy and it also provides some social interaction and some moral reasoning training and those completing the program are 30 percent less likely to be reconvicted than those who receive an alternative community sentence so it has a reasonable success rate but the non-completion rate on the program is often high so often people don't complete the program however it is quite commonly used by the probation service to try and change people's behavior and ways of thinking so cognitive behavioral therapy and another example of a program is aggression replacement training art again is a cognitive behavioral therapy and that's a program for violent or aggressive offenders that's uh, used in this country and that involves training in interpersonal skills through role play anger control techniques teaching people how to deal with their emotions providing offenders with alternative courses of actions as opposed to the use of violence and also moral reasoning training so that's challenging the offenders attitudes by confronting them with moral dilemmas to consider and evaluations mostly show lower reconviction rates for those who've attended ART so that's a good thing but at the same time some evaluations have found that although thinking skills improved behavior didn't so the aggression was still there so to sum it all up um, the final slide we've looked at token economies looked at psychoanalysis we've looked at CPT cognitive behavioral therapy um, last thing and this is linked to Bowlby um, over another policy um, just general awareness in society of attachment disorder um, and as we know attachment disorder arises when an infant or child under the age of five suffers an early life trauma and then fails to form normal loving relationships with their primary carers and that is directly linked to Bowlby's work now attachment disorder is now widely recognized in today's society and it's particularly um, focused within the education setting in this country so strategies for dealing with attachment disorder are now part of every teacher's training program so if you train to be a teacher you will learn about attachment disorder and strategies to improve it so that is a direct policy influenced by individualistic theory and that has led for a greater funding in schools for looked after children LACs um, and those are people who are uh, fostered or um, have been uh, adopted because they are statistically more likely to have experienced maternal deprivation so in a school 
um, schools and local authorities are judged on the performance of their LAC students, their looked after students, and there has to be a designated teacher with responsibility for LACs in every school. So I know that's the case because I used to be the LAC for our the LAC designated teacher for our school. And here you can see you know, the DfE guidance promoted the education of looked after children and previously looked after children. Statutory guidance for local authority. Statutory means law. You have to do it. So another policy that's been influenced by individualistic theories. So lots to think on there. Hopefully if you get a question on how individualistic theories have influenced policy, you should be absolutely fine with all those examples. I'll see you soon for my next PowerPoint on 4.1, which will look at sociological theories. Take care.